This first video is just going to really cover kind of the, the basics of water handling in the body and where water lives in the body. And why water is such a big deal, of course, is because it comprises around 60% of an adult animal's body weight uh, and almost 80% in a neonate. So that dehydration can obviously lead to death, uh, especially if there are really profound fluid losses in small animals. It's kind of important to think about you know, how water comes into the body and how it goes out of the body. And so we compare this kind of in versus out, and of course it's a balance. And when we talk about potential ins, I think we can all obviously think about how much an animal drinks or eats as a typical in. But then as veterinarians, we can give animals IV or sub-Q fluids, and those are different ins, obviously. Now outs, I think most of us can realize that urine is a big out, but also GI fluid leaving the body, uh, and then more insensible losses, such as when an animal pants or even sweats in the case of horses. Those can be profound outs. And so these are things that you're potentially going to assess in your patients uh, when you're trying to figure out why they're dehydrated. When we talk about actually where fluid lives in the body, uh, I a large component of it is surprisingly in the intracellular space. So this is the intracellular fluid space, and that actually has around two-thirds of our fluid. So that's what lives in our cell. And when we talk about shifts of fluid and shifts actually of electrolytes and ions, we talk about shifts between the intracellular and the extracellular fluid space. And the extracellular fluid space is only around one-third. And extracellular fluid includes actually our blood. So what's in our blood, what's in our plasma. It also includes our intercellular fluid. So what's between our cells. That's an important one. And there can be shifts in all of these areas. What fluid is in our GI tract? Obviously in large animals with rumens, they have a tremendous amount of water within their rumen on a regular basis. And then the last, which is I think a little harder to understand, is something called transcellular fluid, which I like is better as the name, the third space. And this third space includes uh, areas such as the abdominal cavity, the pleural cavity, and even the pericardial space. And in large animals, they normally have some fluid here, although it can increase. In small animals, the, the fluid essentially that bathes the organs that's between the the sort of parietal pleura or um, viscera and, and pleura, that is a very minuscule amount, except when fluid accumulates, and that's when we talk about third space fluid. So the kidneys, of course, the whole point of this section of the course, are a huge determinant of what our blood volume is. And so the kidneys work in a few different ways. One is the juxtaglomerular cells, and those are the cells that are actually near um, the glomerulus. They will sense decreases in volume of the blood, so-called hypovolemia, and that activates something called the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. And of course, aldosterone works on the distal tubule to reabsorb sodium and chloride, so that stays in the body, and it excretes potassium. But what's important about this is by reabsorbing sodium, especially, you reabsorb water, and so that maintains, of course, your plasma volume. The kidneys also uh, work to release ADH, although they don't do it independently. They do that under um, the body telling them to actually respond to ADH. And so that results, or that's part of it, is the carotid sinus receptors, baroreceptors. And these guys actually detect, so these are going to detect the low volume, and it's going to tell the hypothalamus to make ADH. And then that ADH in the kidneys is going to reabsorb what's called free water. And free water is essentially water that lacks sodium and chloride. And you may also reabsorb sodium in the process. So when we talk about aldosterone, we're not talking about free water. When we talk about free water, we're talking really about ADH. And so ADH will be released from the kidneys so that water will be reabsorbed. Now, plasma osmolality is also sensed by osmoreceptors, and these are also within the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is exceedingly important, obviously. 
see if I can get that. And so this responds to hyperosmolality. And one of the things that increases plasma osmolality is sodium. In fact, sodium always increases plasma osmolality. But there are other things as well that can contribute, and this includes increases in urea, really marked increases in glucose, and then even exogenous substances such as ethylene glycol, um, things like mannitol um, and ethanol, methanol. And so, but sodium's the big driver. And so if sodium's increased, you're going to have an increase in osmolality. And this is going to promote the thirst center to tell you to drink water. So one thing that will happen, it will tell you to drink water, tell your patient to. And also ADH is going to be released. So the hypothalamus is then going to tell, is going to release ADH. It's going to go to the kidneys and you're going to reabsorb water. So the real whole point about this is understanding the difference where aldosterone works, which is in the distal tubule, and you reabsorb free water, um, and ADH, excuse me, you reabsorb sodium chloride in water, whereas ADH works more in the collecting tubules or the collecting ducts, and you reabsorb free water. So let's actually talk about sodium for a second. So we evaluate sodium along with chloride, but it's really sodium that's the driving force when we're evaluating it. Chloride can also be affected by acid base, so we'll talk about chloride separately. So we're always going to look at sodium first. An increase is in sodium is termed hypernatremia, whereas a decrease is termed hyponatremia. And when you have an elevation in sodium, which is, again, hypernatremia, that's always going to increase your osmolality and stimulate those things that we just talked about. So when we talk about hypernatremia, we typically interpret it as dehydration, but there's a variety of things that can actually lead to that. And we've talked about dehydration uh, in terms of how we identify it being such as a relative erythrocytosis, increases in proteins. We'll talk about azotemia and how that is used. But an increase in sodium most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, is going to be dehydrated. Or due to dehydration, but there's specific causes. And one of those causes is actually not having water. So uh, you either can't take water in, uh, you don't have access to water, um, so no access is one possibility. Frozen ice water the, didn't, it didn't turn off, maybe it's automated, an automated waterer. Um, there's some sort of oral lesion, perhaps, and perhaps you're thirsty, but you just can't bear the thought of actually drinking water. Um, you have an abnormal thirst response, so maybe you have a brain tumor, uh, or you have some sort of inflammation or even trauma. And then the last thing would be neurologic disease. So neuro disease to the point where you can't drink water because you're obtunded. Maybe you were given some sort of medication that made you very stuporous and you couldn't um, get water that way. So the next is a loss of free water. And so again, free water is non-salty water. So you lose free water by essentially having an issue um, with ADH. There are insensible losses such as panting and hyperventilation, but what we're, we're mostly talking about is an ADH issue. And this ADH issue can be central. And so this would be a hypothalamus issue. So perhaps there is, it's either congenital or more common, it's either from a tumor or trauma, or you can have nephrogenic. And of course, both of these are diabetes insipidus. So I'm going to abbreviate that DI. And so causes of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus are much more common. It's more often acquired than inherited. And in this case, the distal renal tubular cells and the collecting duct, they're not actually responding to ADH. So things that we've talked about thus far are E. coli infections can cause that. Not all of them, but some of them. You can have hypercalcemia cause it. Steroids can cause this antagonism essentially of the ADH receptor. All of these, that's how they work. Uh, there's certain drugs that can cause antagonism of the ADH receptor persistent decreases in potassium, uh, and then even kidney disease, where you have an issue with those later cells within the kidney. All right, another cause a little bit less common is loss of water, free water specifically, that is greater than your loss of sodium. 
And the most common cause here is an osmotic diarrhea or osmotic diuresis, where you're losing a lot of water but not as much sodium, so you dehydrate. And then the last would be some sort of sodium toxicity. Uh, and this is typically um, perhaps a salt poisoning. Dogs, there was a, some studies or some papers years ago on dogs that ate homemade Play-Doh. And one that I heard about recently was an improperly made um, milk replacer that an animal was getting. So sodium toxicity, um, and that would require a relevant history. The last one we rarely see, and that's an excess of aldosterone. It's very, very important um, to treat hypernatremia when it's present very slowly um, because of the various substances within the brain and the amount of cell swelling that can happen. So your body equilibrates too because sodium can cross cell membranes, water crosses cell membranes. And so what will happen is your cells will get used to the amount of sodium that is there if you then suddenly add a lot of water for this patient, free water, it rushes into the cells and it causes cell swelling. And so that could obviously cause death within the brain. So we have to correct elevations in sodium very, very slowly. The video on renal physiology goes in a little bit more detail about how the kidney actually handles sodium specifically um, and the various parts of the kidney. There will be a separate video on decreases in sodium and chloride.